yours with... <laughs> The Owl House theme is absolutely bananas. Today we're going to take a look at the complex music theory behind the theme and what makes it so cool. Let's take a look at the entire theme first and then I'll break it down. So before we can really break down the theme, we have to talk about some relatively complex music theory. You might already be familiar with modal interchange. It's the idea that you can borrow chords from parallel modes, or alternate inversions of the major scale. I'm not going to go too much into it, but check out Music with Miles' video on the subject if you want to learn more. The most common application of modal interchange is to borrow chords from parallel minor. Most of you are probably familiar with the wistful sound of the four minor. This kind of darker, more pensive sound is a result of staying in major, in this case C major, but borrowing this 4 minor chord from C minor. But this concept can be taken even further. As we know, C minor is the relative minor of E flat major, meaning they share the same notes. So when we're borrowing a chord from C minor while we're in C major, you could say that we're borrowing from E flat major. But what if we take this one step further and borrow from the parallel minor of E flat major, which would be E flat minor? When we do this, we're also technically borrowing from G flat major, and then we go to G flat minor, so on and so forth. Because of the beautiful symmetry of the 12 tone Western chromatic scale, this wraps us back around and leaves us with this four sided matrix. I've coined the term relative axis interchange for this system as the counterpart to parallel modal interchange. This system has overlap with modal interchange in that we can borrow chords from the immediate parallel minor in both systems. However, in this one, we can also borrow chords from relative minors parallel major and relative minors parallel majors relative minors parallel major. For simplicity's sake, let's just call that second one inverse major. In essence, axis interchange is kind of just modal interchange of modal interchange of modal interchange. It's sort of like calculus, but for a career that makes no money. It's important to think of the system as having sides of the axis rather than points. Since any major's relative minor shares the exact same notes and chords, the only difference between them is context. We're not borrowing any unique colors by going between the two, so functionally they're kind of the same. We can only get a different color by venturing onto a different side of the box. Also, not really relevant to the video, but keep in mind since this diagram only covers 4 of 12 possible key centers, there are two other axes that exist. Okay, so long-winded explanation aside, how does this relate to the tune? Let's take a look at that chord progression in the beginning. We start the tune in C minor, then go to A flat major. No problems there, and since A flat major is diatonic to C minor, it's a very expected sound. But then, we go to B major and F sharp major. As you can tell by the colors, we've borrowed these chords from the F sharp major side of the axis. B major and F sharp major are 4 and 1 in F sharp, respectively. You've probably noticed that this F diminished 7 chord hasn't been given a color. Diminished 7 chords aren't diatonic to the major scale, or its respective natural minor scale, so it isn't found anywhere on the axis. So where does this even come from? This chord, I would argue, is the most clever chord in the entire tune, both in the way it functions musically and how it thematically ties in to both the tune and the theory behind it. The notes in the diminished 7 chord are F, A flat, B, and D. Diminished 7 chords are symmetrical, meaning no matter which way you stack it, it's still a diminished 7, but under a different root. So most of the time, the way we figure out which of the four possible chords it is, is either by looking at the root or the chords surrounding it in the context. I mentioned earlier that fully diminished 7 chords aren't naturally found in the major or natural minor scale. However, 
the similar half diminished or minor 7 flat 5 chord is. Comparing this F diminished 7 to the F minor 7 flat 5, which is diatonic to F sharp major, we can see that the only difference is the top note, which is raised by a half step. So then surely, this chord functions as a diminished alteration of F sharp major's F minor 7 flat 5, right? But what comes after this chord in the context of the tune? It loops us back around to C minor, and since diminished 7 chords are symmetrical, couldn't this also technically be a D diminished 7? C minor diatonically has a D minor 7 flat 5, which also has a one note difference with this diminished 7 chord we've been looking at. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. Because of the symmetrical nature of this chord, it could functionally be a diminished 7 chord of either tonal center, its function further obfuscated by the weird chords and axis jumping. And its bizarre, almost functionality isn't restricted to these two sides of the axis, it could also function in the other two sides. Diminished 7 chords are functionally similar to dominant 7 chords, in that they both have a distinct tritone pull towards a specific chord. In the Berkeley Jazz idiom, they teach that diminished 7 chords function as the upper structure of a dominant 7 flat 9. Our F diminished 7 could certainly imply just that, since if we threw a G under the chord, it would be a G7 flat 9. But I don't think this restrictiveness is the correct way to analyze this chord in this context. Something fascinating is that if you drop down one of the four notes in the diminished 7 by a half step, you'll get one of four different dominant 7 chords, which naturally want to resolve down a fifth. Let's see what happens when we alter each note in the F diminished 7. As you can see, depending on how you interpret which note wants to pull downwards, it could resolve to any of the four tonal centers in our axis. I'm convinced this harmonic ambiguity was deliberate, as it's not only the perfect pivot chord between the F sharp major and C minor sides of the axis, but the ambiguous nature of this chord's possible resolutions make the ear think we could also go to one of the other two sides of the axis. You've probably noticed already, but our relative axis system's four tonal centers also form a diminished 7, because of the symmetry. The references to this diminished motif don't stop here. Notice what the melody outlines in the beginning. C, E-flat, and G-flat form a diminished triad, or three out of the four notes in a diminished 7. If this motif couldn't be any more overt, let's take a look at the second part. It plays the sequence three-ish times each time starting on a different note of the aforementioned diminished triad. Altogether, a very cohesive sound that plays a huge part in the grungy yet cartoony magic vibe of not only the theme, but the show as well. There is one final part of this piece that is so cool to me though, and it's right after the middle section. At a glance, it's pretty much the exact same thing as we've had before this, but instead of resolving back to C minor, we're resolving to C major. But this makes all the difference in bringing the chord progression to another level. We've been in C minor for the entirety of the tune up until this point, so if we were to go to another tonal center, the next logical one would be the relative major, E flat major, since they share all the same notes and chords. But instead, we resolve to the parallel major, which, aside from having wacky harmonic implications, which we'll talk about in a second, has a relatively jarring yet refreshing contrast. It's not necessarily uncommon for tunes to otherwise be in minor, but always resolve to the parallel major. If I can go on a very quick tangent to demonstrate this, let's look at the chorus of Legends Never Die from that one game that I quit last video. Notice that all of the chords are diatonic to E minor, but the one chord at the beginning of each phrase is E major. It just gives a kind of bright, gutsier feeling than if it just resolved to the expected E minor. 
but the Owl House takes this one step further and makes it cooler. Most other tunes that have this parallel major minor interplay use the major chord resolution as parallel modal interchange in a minor key. This tune, however, uses axis interchange and jumps to three different sides, each time moving counterclockwise along the axis. Something I find neat is that on the first shift, we hit A flat, the four of E flat major, and then on the second shift, we hit B, which is the four of F sharp major. Just an interesting way of using the same chord quality and scale degree function to establish each side of the axis. Then, same as before, we have the F sharp as the one of the F sharp major side of the axis, then come back to the F diminished seven. It was already a cool sound when it resolved to C minor, but it's even cooler now. Because of the dominant seven flat nine kind of sound normally attributed to the diminished seven chord, it normally wants to resolve to minor chords. This kind of sound is strengthened in the context because this is how it resolved every other time in the tune. Which is why, combined with the chromatic melody that so desperately wants to walk down to the note E flat, which is diatonic to both C minor and F sharp major, we then resolve to C major with E in the melody. It's such a triumphant, bright sound. After this section, it recapitulates the melody from the beginning, including the original C minor, before doing this B major to C major thing at the very end. Something neat is that the B major highlights the sharp 11, F, in the melody. As the four of F sharp major, this checks out, since sharp 11 is a so-called acceptable tension on this chord. But in the context, I would argue the F serves to voice lead towards the upcoming C major, since not only is F diatonic to C, but in a normal 5-1 resolution, F would be the 7th of G7, which voice leads down to the E in C major. If you'll notice, resolving to C major from the F sharp side of the axis is a jump to the opposite side, which is what gives this resolution its uniquely bright and uplifting sound. I guess really the last thing to talk about is, was any of this deliberate or am I rambling about advanced music theory for no reason? Honestly, as with most tunes, I doubt the composer broke down this chord progression as in-depth as I did as he was writing it. Though I can probably assume he knows a good amount of music theory, I would also guess a lot of it was kind of figured out by ear. What I love is that either way, the non-theory analysis still stands. Regardless of the theory behind it, there is a kind of palpable deliberation in choosing those chords at the end to give it such a bright sound amidst the otherwise cartoony, dark, witchy feel. If I was a high school English teacher, I would draw a connection between the theme's bright resolution, Luz's infectiously positive personality, her name, and this other thing that has to do with her, which I won't spoil, but if you watch the show, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But anyways, that's just a theory. Oh!